If you cannot, please hit us up on the chat. Let us know. Um, but <clears throat> today you're gonna we're gonna be talking uh, about the compliance, not security. But we had three different companies here: Sphere, uh, Cardon Compliance, and Lutrum IT Solutions. Um, let's get this moving forward. Uh, definitely a fact here. Uh, no one likes to go to the doctor to get their identity stolen. Um, it's our responsibility uh, to take care of our patients' uh, well-being and also take care of their information that they give us. So that's important. Uh, today we're going to be learning about preparing for an audit, uh, understanding that, what you need to have uh, to achieve that, uh, HIPAA compliance versus security risks. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, developing sound security programs. Uh, that's definitely going to be important. Uh, we're going to be detecting or about detecting unauthorized access to PHI. Uh, this is extremely important. Um, as you guys stay busy throughout the day, we definitely want to know uh, who's uh, looking at our patient's information. So this is important. How breaches occur. Um, you guys see it on the news every day. So we definitely want to uh, give you a little bit of education on that and how that happens and how can we prevent that. And then uh, why people along with technology are key to achieving PHI security. I uh, introduce myself. I'm with Lutrum IT Solutions. Uh, Lutrum IT is a healthcare IT managed service provider uh, improving electronic medical records uh, experiences for small and medium sized healthcare organizations. Uh, our HIPAA and high tech compliance service offer offerings help healthcare organizations embrace IT security without breaking the bank. Uh, we understand that you're a small business, so we're not coming in here with um, huge invoices or, or massive costs that you would normally see. Uh, we really try to work hard with you financially uh, and make sure that your patient's information is protected. Uh, I'm Lance Malone. I'm the senior service manager here. Uh, a little bit about myself, uh, I came from the United States Army as a signal support system specialist, uh, dealing with information technology equipment and IT security. Uh, I'm a cybersecurity analyst now uh, in the civilian world, <laughs> and I'm also on the board of directors for a new age uh, power plant that's going up. I'm going to be handling all their IT security for them. And we got Sphere. Um, Raymond uh, Ribble, uh, definitely a great guy. You're going to hear from him today. Uh, he found the company back in 2013 to address the growing needs to know who is looking uh, at your EPHI. Uh, the solution allows security and compliance professionals the ability to drill down into any anomaly and determine if access is authorized and acceptable. Um, so he's going to definitely go on there. A little bit about Raymond, uh, successful entrepreneur, Fusion Systems, AMS, IMR Global. Uh, you've probably heard of these companies. Um, he's also a certified service partner for a uh, high-tech program. Um, Southern California Meaningful Use Consultant, 25 years of international business expertise. Definitely a lot of experience there. Uh, 30 years in the information technology and aerospace, investment, bacon, retail, healthcare. Uh, it's a great all-around guy. Uh, you'll enjoy listening to him today. And then, um, then we got Donna. Uh, you guys are really going to enjoy her. Um, she's from the Cardon Group LLC, uh, which was founded back in 1999. Uh, it's a system integration consulting firm. Um, they started doing HIPAA implementations back in 2003, and. Uh, Looks like here she's a podcaster and a blogger, speaker. Uh, definitely uh, cares a lot about HIPAA and cares about your uh, your business. Uh, she's a certified HIPAA privacy and security expert, uh, certified in healthcare privacy compliance in 29 years in the healthcare IT, dental programming, tech support, consulting, and training. So as you see, everyone, we've got a great um, eclectic group here of people that can answer most of your questions and also help you focus on what's important for security and how you can take care of your patients. So uh, Donna, I'm going to go ahead and pass that off to you. Hi guys. Thanks Lance. Um, yeah, I just noticed I have to update that 29 years in healthcare IT. I held out until the last minute to go to 30. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> that is a visual now. I'll go to 30. So <clears throat> we're going to go a little bit over. We just did who is card compliance and sphere. and 
I'm going to talk more from the HIPAA side and the uh, breach security kind of area about compliance itself uh, and why just being compliant isn't your goal, but it certainly should be the beginning of your goal. And HIPAA itself is a little different. We're going to talk about why, what OCR expects of you in your program. The enforcement folks generally get to set the tone for what should be there and why you need to be constantly monitoring and reviewing your systems and programs. So first let's talk about HIPAA and what makes it different. We all started with HIPAA in uh, 2003 and uh, it had a voluntary compliance component, very low enforcement. In fact, enforcement really was hardly done at all. And um, over time, it was uh, apparent that that was not netting very good results. And as we move into a world surrounded by technology and EHR, it expanded that surface area, that data that needed to be protected. And that's what made uh, HIPAA get some additional um, teeth, we'll say. And the key piece under HIPAA is if you can't show you're actually doing this stuff, then we don't know it's happening and you have to be able to prove it. So if it isn't documented, it didn't happen. And that's one of the key components that often people will miss within HIPAA compliance itself is there's no documentation. But in the end, that documentation has to happen if you have any formal cybersecurity program at all. So whether it's using the National Cybersecurity Framework or High Trust or any other framework, a formal program requires that documentation. And then as part of that formal program, constant monitoring and reviews, if you don't do that, then you're never really going to know if there's a problem. Um, it's kind of like the you know, alarm systems on your house. If you never set it, you don't know that somebody's coming in and looking around and moving your stuff and touching your stuff. So it's a big uh, piece of the pie is to actually look and see what's happening. And the biggest reason that uh, we need to monitor and manage all of our data in a healthcare environment is you can cancel a credit card, but no one knows how to cancel the medical record. And there's really no way to do it. Once your medical identity is stolen, to pull that EHR information that went in as them from their data into yours is virtually impossible. So you constantly, from that point forward for the rest of your life, have to monitor. Imagine if the person who stole your medical identity has a serious illness or you have a serious illness and they don't. The different blood types, there's, there's a lot of concerns. Once it happens, there's no going back. So there's a lot of reasons that we need to protect this data and that's what makes HIPAA different is the surface area, the extensive requirements that cover both the privacy of the data and the security of the data. And unfortunately, most cybersecurity specialists are going to tell you HIPAA security rules just scratch the surface of what we need to be doing. So at least be doing the HIPAA portions of the rule to be able to get us started on moving forward. So the protections of HIPAA we're trying to get the thing, there we go, uh, are enforced by OCR, which is the Department of Health and Human Services Office for Civil Rights. Their uh, new audit program protocols were released this year, and they started their audit program. The audit program is currently in play. All of the desk audits, the first round of phase two, have been completed, and the information has been sent into the OCR auditors for review. Uh, they will be beginning the business associate phase of that audit in the end of September. So if you're lucky enough to be chosen, those chosen few, you'll be getting your notification in the next few weeks. I know, excitement is overwhelming to most of us BAs just waiting, pick me, pick me. Nope, not. Nah, don't want to be picked. Because the audit protocol that they follow there's 180 line items. It's in a spreadsheet. You can do go download it, uh, review it. It's stimulating reading, uh, real page turner, or you could just trust me when I say there's a lot of stuff in there. Each line item has roughly two to ten questions associated with it. 
and as I mentioned before with documentation, documentation is mentioned 250 times in those uh, protocols and the words obtain and review. So they're going to ask you to give them things that are documented and it's evidence and policies and procedures and all of those kind of things. In the end, they really only want one thing and that's proof of a robust compliance program. So if you can't prove it, it didn't happen. And the reason all of these things are really coming into play now is if we look at what happens and what goes wrong. I mentioned the identity theft issues. Um, it gets bigger and bigger as you look at it. You certainly need to protect our patients' privacy and most people wouldn't think at all it was acceptable to just broadcast information about their patients out in the middle of a busy mall and that's essentially what we're doing if we're shooting it out on the internet except the mall is the size of the world. So the Poneman Institute does a research study, this is the sixth year in a row that they've done it, and they found all kinds of information. The last two years they've now included business associates in the study as well as covered entities and it's very clear when a breach occurs the patient data is the most valuable data. That's what they're after. They're not looking for financial information on your business. They're looking for your patient data. And the increase in successful attacks has made it so that for the first time, the last two years, the uh, number one reason for a breach is a external hack, a cyber attack, whereas before it was loss of a laptop or a mobile device or somebody fell asleep with their laptop in their lap on the subway, which that went really well for them. So in the study, it was very interesting data, 50% or have no, little or no confidence that they actually can detect the data loss after a breach. So, you know, there's so roughly less, well, 15, 18% actually believe that they can protect the data and have very confident uh, programs in place that they believe are there and you've got to wonder how overconfident they may be. So looking at their uh, industry as a whole, there's certainly some problems with security that we have in place and when we look at how a breach is discovered, it's even more telling that both covered entities as well as business associates find the breaches in very similar ways. An auditor assessment, so they're looking, they're monitoring, they're paying attention, is the number one way that a covered entity finds them. And an employee finds them. You've got vigilant employees. And then if you look at the third and fourth, you've got patient complaints. Nobody wants those. And then, of course, the accidental upon a breach scenario. Business associates basically the same way. An employee detects it, the vigilance of an employee, or an auditor assessment. We're watching, we're paying attention, and then of course theirs is, we stumbled upon it, is the number three. So certainly you don't want to stumble upon it, you don't want a patient complaint, you don't want a law enforcement or any of those other ways, you'd rather find it on your own one of those two ways, and that requires looking. <clears throat> the reason we need to look is that um, healthcare has now got a giant target on its back. There is no doubt about it, none whatsoever, that healthcare's target is increasing rapidly. In May, the Tor founder, and if you don't know what Tor is, it's the browser that allows you to get out on that illegal part of the internet, the dark net where everybody's anonymous and all that scary hacker stuff takes place. And um, so this guy's the one that he, he did the Tor browser is allows you the anonymous capabilities and he says based on his knowledge of what the hackers are doing medical identity theft is poised to take over as the primary form of identity theft he's expecting that to happen any time now and the reason being is you can become so much and there's so much value so a great deal of value for the medical records and to go out and use this insurance coverage and just to be uh, um, obvious about how bad it can be, a security uh, researcher for IBM really did have to go to the CFO and the billing manager of a hospital and bear their midriff to prove they had no scar from a surgery they were being billed for, 20 grand. 
So as we know, most security folks say today, you either know you've had a breach or you haven't figured it out yet. It's not that you haven't had a breach. And then we get to June. So that was in May. Now in June, a large number of different medical practices started showing up out on the dark web for sale. And I'm sure it didn't have anything to do with the tour guy saying it. It was already in action. And uh, here in Georgia, in case you can't tell, I'm southern. Um, I, I know that my accent is very well hides it. But I uh, am in Georgia, and as soon as this hit the dark net and the news came out that there was almost 400,000 patients for sale from Georgia, everybody was all over it. And so the uh, hacker was interviewed to see if he really was in there. And the hacker shared these screenshots of the server that the hacker was in. And then that they went into the EHR. And sure enough, that is, uh, there you can see, it says uh, right here on the screen, Athens, Georgia. And uh, there are several different screenshots from the EHR itself where we can see a great deal of detail. There's Covington. And uh, we know that these patients are definitely in the um, area of Athens because next they posted actual dumps of the data out on a place called Pastebin where you can basically get a hold of any kind of text. And right there at the top, the very top line, Athens Orthopedic Clinic from Athens, Georgia, uh, United States, uh, leaked patient PHIPII records. And then here at the end it says pay up KO. And just uh, as a note, KO is the CEO of Athens Orthopedic Clinic. And if you haven't caught the news, uh, let's just say Athens Orthopedic Clinic is all over the news now. And there you see CEO KO Elliott said, that it cannot afford to spend millions and continue to deliver care services. That's just uh, when talking about the credit monitoring for those 400,000 people. Uh, it doesn't talk about the fines and the penalties and all these others. And clearly they weren't looking because they had no idea until the hacker let them know that they were in there. If you want to get some more details on the hacker called the Dark Overlord, you can listen to the podcast. We just did an episode on it. Uh, uh, help me with hippa.com slash 66 will take you right to that episode and you can listen to our little uh, podcast out there on HIPAA and cybersecurity. So to recap, HIPAA is different from other compliance programs. OCR does expect proof that you have privacy and security and you take it seriously. You're not just checking a box. You need to have that documentation in place. They give you 10 days to give it to them. Most breaches are discovered through assessments, audits, and vigilant employees, so you've got to be looking or it's going to boil over on you. A watch pot never boils. Well, you certainly don't want yours boiling. So keep an eye on things because healthcare data attacks are expected to grow at a rapid rate, and if the dark overlord is any indication, there's going to be a lot more in 2016. So I'm going to hand it over to Ray. Good afternoon, everybody, and Donna, thank you. I always love listening to your southern accent and your, your, little, uh, your little side notes there. Uh, I thought I'd start us off with the Dark Lord. Uh, there he is, because that's what we believe, and Donna talked about the fact that they're out there. Uh, I think what the point I want to make and what I want to drill down on today for everybody is when Donna showed you the example of what happened at Athens Orthopedic, what they saw if they were to go in and look at their uh, audit logs was they just saw a user moving through the system and they assumed that that was normal when in fact what had happened was the dark lord here, this person that we believe was in there, uh, basically was able to access usernames and passwords which unfortunately were on that same server, correct Donna? And uh, then uh, went in and just used those passwords and logins in order to access all that data. So it was pretty straightforward, very, very poor security standards that were uh, put in place within that organization. Uh, the reality is, quite often, uh, the individual who might be stealing from us could be an employee, or it's an individual like our dark lord here that uh, was able to get a hold of their password and login. Um, so as we talked about at the beginning, and I want to reiterate, 
no one goes to the doctor to get their identity stolen. Uh, and I'm a good example of that. And speaking with Lance before our presentation today, he told me that he was uh, recently in a, uh, a victim of identity theft. I'm, I'm an Anthem customer. I'm a Kohl's customer. I am a uh, Home Depot customer. And I'm a Target customer. So uh, not just in healthcare, but in all industries. Uh, we're subject to this. And Donna again talked about the fact that once that data is out there, it's out there forever. So you know, in that sense, I feel like I'm not safe. Um, but for the practices, for what we want to talk about today in terms of uh, reputational harm, um, there's four things that I want you to take away from this. Patient trust, right? Uh, basically, they come in, uh, the trust that a patient has with a doctor is second to none. Uh, they will turn to them for the simplest things and the most important of things. Yet, nobody ever gave consideration to technology as being part of that mix, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. Um, I know everybody hates technology as part of the mix, but they are forced to understand how to use that and how to implement solutions that are streamlined, easy to use, and provide a lot of value to the organization. Um, the loss of current patients, well, if you do get breached, if you end up in the news like Athens, uh, patients are going to start turning elsewhere very quickly. And I've got some anecdotal evidence that will uh, point that out from the FBI. Uh, future patients, well, you're going to lose the ones you have, and then you're going to lose the ones that, that might be coming to you in the future. And, and again, just to reiterate in terms of that brand value, what Poneman said was that uh, as a direct result of the incident, 21% uh, saw an average to diminished value to their brand. Uh, so that hits home pretty fast. Uh, we want to uh, make sure that we can avoid that. So we talked about HIPAA is not uh, HIPAA compliance is not security, and, and I want to draw, draw that home for you a little bit. There are two different paradigms. Um, you can work with Donna and people like Donna and her side to make sure that you are HIPAA compliant. You can do your security audit. You can do your system audit. You can sit down and put your policies and procedures in place and make sure that they're documented so that when they do do that OCR or CMS, or HHS audit, you can point specifically to the training that you've conducted, to the education that's going on. But on the security side, how do you protect your patient's data? It's no longer in files against the wall that you can lock the door at the end of the night and set the alarm. It's now in the cloud. I believe greater than 90% of the EHR systems that are out there are in the cloud. Some of the larger organizations on the call today might have an on-premise system. But if it's connected to the internet, it's just as vulnerable to an attack as somebody who's in the cloud. And by being in the cloud, it doesn't mean that they're going to attack you in the cloud at that server base. They're just going to be able to get to that data via that login and password a lot easier than they could in the past. Being certified does not equate to being safe. So if somebody comes in and certifies that you've gone through HIPAA compliance and that you're good for this year. One of you, you might be saying, well, look, every year we've gone in and we've conducted our security risk assessment. And every year we've shown a steady increase in what we do. Does that mean we're safe? I think if you get audited, it might mean that uh, you're in a better position. Obviously, you would never be found guilty of willful neglect. But it doesn't mean that you're safe. And uh, again, I'm going to keep pointing back to some of the things that Donna said because they were so poignant. Is it only takes one breach to ruin your business. And so you need to be diligent all the time with regard to that, uh, that data that's out there, your PHI, uh, and making sure that it is safe and constantly going back and investigating what you have going on there. I believe being compliant is a starting point. I believe that you want to work with a professional within your organization. And if you don't have one that's trained, then go outside and find a consultant, such as Donna's organization or Lutrum, and work with them to make sure that you're doing everything that you possibly can do within your means in order to make sure that you're compliant and in order to make sure that you are security. And that goes to my next point, the point in time. right? So it's a starting point. It's not an end point. Um, manual processes are too slow, too costly, and they keep you away from what you want to do, which is to provide patient care. And so what I wanted to do today is present you with some alternatives to that that you can look at. And finally, look at compliance as a risk metric. Um, I'm not going to go through this whole slide here other than to say uh, the deck is going to be available on the, uh, um, the webinar today. Uh, or you can reach out to any of us so we can get you a copy of it if you'd like me to speak to you or Donna to speak to you uh, uh, more in depth about any of our points. We're always happy to do that for you. 
I think the big thing that I want to get down here is at the bottom is a proactive security policy reduces the likelihood of a breach and helps reduce your expenses because again, Donna pointed out with Athens Orthopedic, they couldn't afford to do what was necessary to protect their patients at the end of the day. These are the standards. These are the ones that you're told you're supposed to uh, adhere to. I'm not going to read those, don't worry. Um, but there are others. Uh, here in California, we have a program called the California Technology uh, Assistance Program. In other states across the U.S., uh, the state governments are working together either through local uh, groups to provide assistance over and above what Meaningful Use did. In many of those instances, what I have found in talking to our customers is that there are new caveats that the states are imposing with regard to monitoring user activity within the system, both from your organization itself and if you're a BA, also knowing uh, which BAs have access, what do they have access to, and are you tracking them properly. Uh, a common example would be uh, we just visited an organization that uses the ID guest and they allow every single business associated to log in through guest. So they actually have no idea which organization is in there working at that time. Those are the type of things that you cannot do. Those are the type of things that are going to get you fined if you get audited. Uh, the security rule origin, uh, I'm just going to focus on that first one. When the rule was conceived back in 2001, uh, people weren't talking about cloud computing. They weren't talking about the proliferation of EHR and EMR systems. Uh, we had no idea how far the BYOD was going to go. Uh, with wearables now, with the amount of personal information that is being put out there, both in terms of the Internet of Things and just in the Internet itself. And so a lot of the organizations, everybody on this call, we're all playing catch up. We're trying to make sure that we stay one, head of, one step ahead of the bad guys. Um, and I'm trying to do my part. Donna's trying to do her part. Donna taught me something reasonable and appropriate is what uh, HIPAA tells you. Unfortunately, reasonable and appropriate isn't going to get you to the end of the game and keep you safe. In terms of the provisions uh, for covered entities, I listed here some of the things that I think you want to take uh, some time and look at, make sure that you're conversant with. Um, again, I don't want to read a slide to you, but I do want you to take the time to do your homework, look at this, and make sure that your organization is properly positioned in terms of uh, what type of safeguards are in place to protect your PHI. Uh, what we did is we were a member of the high-tech program here in Southern California. We worked with over 2,000 uh, medical offices in SoCal and helping them to move from paper-based to electronic record system. Uh, I'm going to make the assumption that everybody on the call today is now in that world, functioning in that world, and at some level proficient. What we found was that in 2,000 organizations, not one of them had implemented any processes, whether manual or otherwise, in order to make sure that the that was the catalyst that got us to looking for a solution that was cost effective, could be used anywhere from a single private practice all the way up to a large medical organization, and easy to use. The big key here being is I want to do patient care. I don't want to be taking care of some IT technology solution. So we created Sphere with the idea that it was simple to use and that um, you could be in and out of it in a very short period of time. Uh, these were some of the cybersecurity risk issues that we looked at when we were doing that. Obviously, there's the organization. So we deal with customers. We're dealing with organizations like yourself. And so this is a strategic goal for you. And at the bottom was the first slide I led with was reputational. Uh, the public image that you have out there, what do your clients perceive you're doing? And it's kind of like we say, I don't go to the doctor to get my ID stolen. So let's keep going. This slide is probably my favorite slide to bring home, and I think it complements some of the data that Donna was sharing with us. 67% of the breaches that occur are by users who have authorized access. That doesn't necessarily mean it's your employee. Again, it could be a BA that's coming in. And if you sum all of that, 90% of the breaches are reported by outside organizations. So it's when that third-party group comes in to do some type of forensics for you, some type of a study, that's when it's uncovered. Recently, um, I had an opportunity to work with the FBI cybersecurity group, and in speaking with them both in Philadelphia, here in LA, and in Texas, uh, very consistent. 70% of the patients that um, 
were out there uh, said that uh, they would not go to a healthcare entity that had been breached. And what we find is that 60% of the practices that have been breached declare bankruptcy within six months. And personally, I, I'll go out on the limb and say I don't think Athens is going to survive. Uh, Donna, you can correct me if you think I'm wrong. Um, let's keep going forward. Uh, again, I created a checklist. Um, I always like to give everybody a little bit of a takeaway here. You know, after the call's done, go ahead, walk through your office, sit down with the people who are responsible for these duties, and ask yourself, can we say yes to each of these questions in a simple sense? So this isn't the 180 questions that Donna was talking about in her slide. This is a couple that should give you an idea of whether or not you're on the right track in terms of security, not compliance, uh, but security around the PHI that you're using in your office. Uh, and again, we don't want to end up here. We believe that if you're working with organizations like Lutrum, with the people at Carbon, and a tool like we've developed with Sphere, that you can avoid being one of these headlines in some newspaper locally or nationally. Um, so what did we do? We basically took a very, very arduous manual process and we turned it into something that is a machine learning uh, experience. So we used the pattern recognition based technology uh, in order to allow us to look at every single user on your system, whether it's an employee, a business associate, or a third party that you've given access. We look at them over the last 60 days and compare it against today to determine whether or not any anomaly is generated as a byproduct of their usage. If we see something that is strange, we further evaluate that bring that to the attention of the appropriate individual that you've named within your organization. Could be a compliance officer, could be a security officer, could be you, uh, and give you the opportunity to drill down on that data in an actionable manner and determine if a breach has or hasn't occurred. In this case, you're going to go from an alert to an incident. The incident gets investigated, and worst case scenario, you declare a breach. Um, in our years of doing this now, we haven't had that many breaches declared, but we have had some. Uh, more importantly, we've had a number of our clients use our product and avoid heavy fines with OCR and CMS audits. Um, we want to avoid fatigue reduction, and so our system teaches itself. And by doing that, once you've told it yes or no to a certain situation, the Sphere system will learn what's happening. So you don't have to keep going back with some rule that's pre-coded in there and answering the same question every day. That's where the fatigue comes in. That's where we believe a lot of the current technologies that were available uh, were at fault. Uh, we want to take advantage of what's out there today and be positioned to take advantage of what's going to be out there tomorrow. Um, and we're doing this on a daily basis for you. Uh, if you're open on Saturday, it's every day that you're open. And we've made this so it would scale again from primary care all the way up to hospitals. The idea here is continuous, accurate, and streamlined information to allow you to make quick decisions with regard to your data and who's using it. And to that point, what I did is I created a little slide here that I think everybody can identify with. You're somewhere in this range of 100 employees. Now, you might say, hey, we only have 10. We'll scale it a little bit here. Um, if you were to look at 500,000 records in a day, which you would never do, it would take you 35 hours to review all of that. You'd also have to understand how it's coded. With Sphere, our system will review all of that data, only report to you the anomalies that need to be investigated, so that that individual who's responsible will spend somewhere around eight minutes making a determination whether or not an incident needs to be uh, recorded uh, or no further. And let me, let me go back on something. Donna talked about if it isn't documented, it didn't happen. Well, in our system, Every time you receive an alert, all of the information associated with that alert is documented in Sphere, and it's all compartmentalized so that if you do get audited at some point in the future, you're able to bring all of that information up and show that to the auditor at that point. And that will then fit nicely together with what you already have in place in terms of your policies and procedures. Good God, who wants to read this? Nobody. The point here is it's happening every day. It's happening all the time big organizations, small organizations, um, and I think we really need to be careful of the fact that right now uh, the dark lords of the world, employees are able to take advantage of these systems because they know nobody's watching. Um, very simply, 
you have an audit log that's associated with your system. If uh, you went through meaningful use, uh, meaningful use made a requirement that the audit log is part of your system. You're probably being told by your EHR company, oh, we do all of the audit log review for you. Uh, I'm afraid to tell you that's a lie. Uh, what they do is they generate an audit log. You are responsible for printing or reviewing that audit log at some regular basis. Um, if you haven't looked at it, take a look at it. It's a lot of information and very difficult to discern whether or not the information you're looking at is indicative of some uh, malfeasance. We look at 100% of that data 100% of the time across any system that contains EPHI. So it could be your PAC system, it could be your practice management system, it could be your EHR system. We look at all of them. Um, and then that's all done under one license. And then we send those alerts to you. You're able to go in. You can look at users. You can look at patients. If somebody brings, comes in and says, hey, I want to know who's looking at my record for the last 30 days, you're able to print a report and show them exactly what's happening in terms of that activity. And obviously, we store this information for you for six years. If you're in Florida, uh, we know Florida has different rules, so we will store it for seven years for Florida. Uh, so again, I want to emphasize what we're trying to do is make sure that we meet the HIPAA requirements from a security perspective, that we created a solution that for your business is easy to use and set up, and finally, something that is secure by design. Um, I'm going to skip this one. I'm going to go over this. You can see that later on if you'd like to. Um, these are some of, but not all of the major systems that we're working with. I think right now we're compliant with about 80 different EHRs across the United States. And if you're not on this list, that doesn't mean with you. Typically, uh, to build a new adapter, it takes us about three or four weeks. Um, we had one organization here in Southern California that had uh, been approached for an audit. Uh, they were in danger of a $1.7 million uh, fine. Uh, they asked us to come in. We worked very closely with them and the auditors. We implemented SPHERE across over 200 medical uh, organizations that they had within their system. Uh, they came back in on appeal. We were able to reduce the fine to about $50,000. Subsequent to that, they've had 13 OCR audits that have occurred. So pretty much once you're on the radar, they're just going to keep coming back every time and looking at you again and again. So with that, I'm going to wrap up. I'm sorry if I was a little long-winded there. And uh, Lance, I'll pass it back to you for a Q&A. All right, fantastic. Well, I really appreciate that. Uh, so I, we've got one question that keeps popping up um, here. It's uh, how do we get our doctors to understand this? So uh, definitely, I'm sure you guys can chime in on that one. Donna? Yeah, you'd leave me to that. You try charm. <laughs> you try charm, southern charm. No, it, it comes down to um, patience and education because uh, in most cases, uh, you know, we look at it and say that you, you've got three stances when it comes to this stuff. One is, I don't care, I'm not going to do it. Well, I, I can't really uh, do much there. Uh, another is, I have this covered, I don't need any help. Well, just let us come in and do an audit so you got a third party checking it off is kind of what I say uh, so that we can actually start having a conversation. And then there's the middle of, I think I need to do it or I don't need to do it. And those are the ones you can really work with. So if you've got to move somebody from the, I don't need to do this, I don't care, over to the, uh, let's talk about it uh, scenario, it's patient education. And I mean not like patient somebody you're treating, it's patient like, you know, the teacher should be very patient with the student who refuses to learn. Um, so that's what we find is uh, most important and you've got to just get them to listen to somebody. I, I, I agree with that. I, I don't go with scare tactics. Um, I don't believe in those, and I'm, I, you know, I know some of the stuff that you might have seen in my slides look like it's scare tactics. Those are just the facts uh, with regard to security data. Um, we've dealt with a lot of uh, organizations where the, the, the chief medical officer or the lead doctor in the group is basically saying, why do I have to do this? Why do I have to adhere to any of this? And it has nothing to do with patient care. Um, again, we kind of go back to the nobody goes to visit their doctor to get their ID stolen. 
uh, that's, that's the bottom line. It becomes part of the business proposition of how am I securing your records because your records have become a very valuable commodity uh, in bad places and we need to be doing everything that we can to prove to our patients that we're keeping them safe. Just like buying a good alarm to lock the door, we want to make sure that we have safeguards around our data since we've moved in that direction. And so I appeal to that part of it without getting too technical and try to partner with them to make sure they understand that we're trying to do something that's easy to do and that we can work with them proactively to train their staff to use these systems and not get in the way too much. The other thing is make sure you let them read the news because uh, I can't tell you how much activity we've gotten since Athens is all over the news here. Oh, yeah. We have uh, places where the doctors wouldn't even discuss it and now are coming in and having their staff track down help. Yeah. Uh, even here locally, we're in the same thing with Banner, uh, Baywood, one of our largest hospitals here in Arizona. Same deal. It's, it doesn't matter how small or large you are. Uh, it can be compromised if you don't. Uh, protect every aspect of your network. So, Well, and the small or large thing is a common misconception. I can't tell you the number of times we'll hear, well, we're so small, those breaches only happen to large ones. The Dark Overlord's smallest one had like 8,000 patients. It was yeah. a single doctor. So it and doesn't matter. A patient record is worth just short of $400 per record now. Yeah. So that's mm -hmm. And by the way, they can sell that record multiple times. It's not, yeah. it's not a, you hit on this earlier. They don't sell it just once. It stays out there forever, and they keep cashing in on that same record. Um, there's and multiple. Can, yeah, go ahead. No, I definitely keep, um, keep in mind that also that a lot of things with me being a security uh, analyst, I'm, I'm living on that dark web. I'm, I'm looking at these things. I'm trying to figure out what hackers do and how they do it. But we're only talking about the ones that actually show up on the news. We're not even talking right. about the ones that don't even know they've been breached because that's more valuable to the hacker. The hacker wants to make sure you don't know about it and just continue selling that information for years. So, Agreed. Yeah. So um, I've, got an, I've got another one that, that keeps popping up here uh, about the uh, business associates. Uh, are they required to do this? Well, the business associates that um, for years uh, everyone uh, took the approach, well, you just sign a BAA and you can have that business. That's what you have to do to get the business, so to speak. Uh, but today a business associate is separate and equally liable for any loss of patient information, whether uh, any unauthorized use or disclosure can be investigated at the business associate level as well as the covered entity level. So yes, they have to do this stuff. Yeah. They have to do it and we've had a number of uh, large business associate type groups who've reached out to us uh, to partner with them uh, with regard to our technology and our approach to the market. So uh, by all means, I think many of them are aware of the risks that they're at. Uh, they can be audited as well. Uh, so, um, you know, this, this market's only getting bigger, not smaller. Yeah. No, and it's the same. With being a BAA, you know, we deal with a lot of our clientele. And we, we try to educate them a lot about that. Uh, it's very important to make sure that, that not only that legal paperwork's in place, but that they're also uh, abiding by those rules and regulations, too. Well, so. we recommend that you get not only the signature on the contract, but ask them a few questions. Yeah. You'll be, you'll be shocked to see how many of them will sign a contract, and then you say, um, who's your security officer? And they go, well, we don't have one. That's not really required of us. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's no, run. Run very fast if you hear that. <laughs> that's a big red flag right there. Yeah, so. that's number one rule right there. Um, definitely. So uh, how much time we got left here? Let's see if we can get a few more questions in there. Let's see. Here. Yeah, I think we should be able to. All right, fantastic. Uh, let's see what else we got. Um, oh, have you heard about employees looking at other employees and family records? The internal <laughs> breach. Let's talk about that internal breach. Well, uh, I, we certainly hear about it all the time, and uh, it's like when somebody asks me, "How is it that we continue to create new content?" Well, we read the news mm -hmm. uh, and watch Facebook and those kind of things because. 
it is a huge problem and the larger the organization, the more likely that snooping and those things occur. Um, and I've had horror stories told to me that um, there was actually a privacy officer that told me that they had sanctioned an employee for snooping in a family member's record and six months later they were back in her office for snooping in an employee's record and they said, well, didn't you know? We, we just talked about this. She goes, well, I know you have to fire me, but I didn't believe she was sick. <laughs> oh, Lord. So, yeah. So it happens, and, and the larger the organization, the harder it is to keep up with it. So when you've got that out there, um, and, and I could go on and on about, uh, we do uh, holiday horror stories about things that you read on Facebook about people. Yeah. So well, I'm sure well, the spear just... finds it. <laughs> Yeah, we're in, we're in Los Angeles, and uh, obviously with all of the uh, celebrities out here, everybody thinks that your VIP functionality will catch most of that. But the problem we run into with snooping, and snooping is the question that comes up all the time when we're out there uh, talking to potential clients. Is, um, you know, if you have the same last name and the same address, I guess if you had a rule built in your system, that would be easy to catch. The reality is your sister got married, and she has a different last name. So it's not going to be that easy to find out whether or not when you're looking at a different person's record, that's actually snooping. Um, so we look at it a different way. It's a workflow. So one of our detectors actually looks at the workflow associated with that individual. And we know what your normal day's work looks like uh, because we have that mapped. When you all of a sudden step out of that normal process to go look at uh, Susie's record or Ray's record, um, that's going to show up as a bleep on the radar that uh, something was an anomaly there. When you investigate that, well, two and two come together pretty quick. Isn't that your sister? Isn't that your, your brother? Isn't that your mom, your dad, whomever? Um, and that's where the investigation happens. And it happens very fast. We're able to pull up all of the uh, metadata associated with that investigation, and then actions can be taken. So uh, people don't like to know it's there. Uh, I think we get accused of being big brother because of our ability to capture snooping as one of the major offenses. But it is also one of the things that most of the helpful organizations want to make sure that they're addressing. Uh, so uh, we're doing that uh, quite a bit. Yeah, um, and, the, and the business is still responsible, no matter what, for that employee's act, act, actions. and. Then what they do. So that. Yeah, the Orlando Hospital just had an announcement yesterday, I want to say, that they found several employees snooping, uh, uh, an employee that was snooping in the Pulse uh, tragedy into the records of the people brought in that day. And uh, yeah. they just, the curiosity overwhelms them or they're selling it to the media. and those kind of things. So they just had to release an announcement that they fired employees for doing that. Yeah. That's right. I've, yeah. I've, got, a, I've got another good question just came in, guys. Um, you know, they're asking about what if uh, the doctors are checking the medical records at 3, 4 a.m. in the morning. You know, how is that handled? Okay. I think that's, I think that's to me. Um, and, and that's a great question, by the way, because that's exactly the type of anomaly that we want to capture, but there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, so what Sphere does is it, it, it creates this map of the doctor's usage. And the doctors are probably the most uh, erratic of any user in the system because of the schedules that they keep and the type of doctor that they be, whatever their specialty may be. Um, but if they're looking at those records at 3 or 4 in the morning and they usually don't do that, it's going to show up as an anomaly on the system. But uh, the administrator, or the compliance officer, whoever is looking at that data, is able to confirm very quickly why that happened. And if it wasn't the doctor, they can basically, you know, hit the alarm and start going into, you know, breach breach mode. But if it was the doctor and he or she uh, had a, um, a case that they needed to rush over and, and investigate, and possibly a surgery or whatever the case may be. There's nothing wrong with that. And in fact, if that happens on a regular basis, we can teach Sphere to accept that as part of the normal process for that doctor so that you don't keep getting that alert every time it happens. So those are the type of learning experiences that we want Sphere to be um, shown to and have access to so that we can teach the system to identify who those uh, users are in the system. 
So very good. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ray. Um, we got another question here. This is uh, this is going to be more on my my aspect here. It says, uh, how does partnering with an IT company help me with security? Um, and this one's definitely important. The aspect of with, the, with dealing with an IT company is we we work with Sphere, we work with uh, Cardon Compliance, and uh, we're pretty much your your liaison per se. Um, we make sure that the machine, whatever Sphere reports to us, we jump on the network. We're looking at the network's uh, uh, configuration aspects, look at the individual user, shut down that machine instantly if we find that there is an issue, and then we're also looking at the fact of how do we resolve that, how do we fix that. Uh, so we go in and immediately take steps that we need to to capture those log files, get you the evidence that you might need for uh, dealing with that employee or dealing with it with uh, with an outside breach. Uh, so we help you do all, deal with all that uh, instantaneously. Uh, and on top of that, it's about the maintenance. Uh, you know, we're all talking about the logs and everything, but with our company, we focus on that maintenance aspect. Security is not just about just just the logs, but also how that network is maintained, how it's kept updated. Because again, a lot of these breaches that happen, uh, they happen b because of unpatched network equipment or security updates that are not happening. That's what we take care of, so we help try to eliminate those holes uh, that the hackers use to get into your network. Uh, so this is stuff that we work on. Uh, Donna? No, I was just going to say that we, we um, usually um, have to explain to people that that the technology requirements to properly secure a network today are not something you can do on the side. No. You know, it, you have to be, you need professional IT services, whether you have them internally or you outsource them. But, uh, you know, we just had a conversation with a practice yesterday where we asked who does your IT, and they're like, well, the doctor does the patches when he has time. Yeah, but I can assure you that network's been breached. There's oh, no yeah. doubt. About it. Well, and that's the thing. As a, as a hacker, and, and again, I, you know, one of the things this uh, wasn't in the slide, but as a certified ethical hacker uh, myself, I I'm taught these things. These are things that we go through where we try to figure out how does a hacker think. And what a lot of people don't realize is when that security update goes out, it goes out publicly. It tells everybody, hey, here's the breach. Here's how you can compromise a breach, and you need this update to to patch that breach. Well, to us, that's good information because we want to lock it down. But to a hacker, that's also telling the hacker, "Hey, this is how you can get into this network." So that that's something that's extremely important or extremely valuable, not only to us trying to protect your network, but it's also valuable to that hacker trying to figure out how to get into your network. So the the longer you take to do that update, the more susceptible you are to that breach. And an OCR is also. Uh, already released a settlement for someone using an unpatched uh, XP computer that caused a oh, breach. Yeah. So. Oh no, XPs! If you've got a Windows XP on your network, uh, right off the bat, you've already got a huge red flag, and that needs to be taken care of instantly. Yeah, and the big problem is that many of the medical devices use it, so yeah. um, that's a, that's a, a bigger issue there when you go down that path. That's a whole other webinar. Uh, <laughs> yeah, another question popped up about uh, do I, you know, do we provide documentation on patches and security work that you do as an IT company? One of the things that's great about Lutrum LLC uh, is that everything that we do is documented. If we touch a computer, there's a documentation for it. What did we do? How did we do it? What time did we touch it? Um, every if we do security updates, we do patches, we do antivirus cleanup. Maybe our antivirus program or our security solution picked up a, a a virus or or whatever on the network. All that stuff is documented into our into our system, where you can actually log in through your console portal portal or through the customer portal, and you can see what we've been doing on the back end. Uh, on average, we probably spend anywhere between 25 to 30 hours a month on each one of our clients uh, just dealing with keeping stuff updated uh, and fixing different uh, minor issues that are being reported to us through our system. But everything that we do is is documented on the back end in, even for the customer to see. Yeah, reference that 25 to 30 hours a month and somebody doing it on the side that's not even uh, seriously educated. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hey, uh, Ray, it looks like we got one for you. For you, is, uh, if my EHR is not on the on your list, can you still help me? 
Absolutely. Uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty straightforward for us. Um, we, we're not even required to work with the EHR company in order to uh, create the script that will allow us to grab that audit log and import it into our system. Um, but if we do work with them, then it becomes very, very seamless for the end user. But like I said, typically between uh, three and four weeks for us to work together with the organization, get the data logs. What we have to do is we have to go in and we have to teach Sphere how to read the data logs that are coming from that specific system. Uh, no two systems in the United States so far are the same. So I guess that's a good thing or a bad thing, depending on your perspective. But uh, we, we have not come across a system so far uh, that we haven't been able to work with and provide a solution to our customers. So uh, the good news there is that, yes, we can work with you. Fantastic. Uh, can you work with uh, long-term care or assisted living facilities? Uh, I yes, know that's actually. Yeah. We that's have an approach on We already have a, a number of those types of clients uh, in Boston and Rhode Island uh, that we're working with right now. So the answer is yes. Yeah, and definitely. Suddenly? Yeah, same here. Same here. Um, they all they all still abide, or still need to abide by the same rules and regulations. Uh, so yeah, and they they have a lot of unique uh, issues and things that they have to worry about. So, I just want to touch back on that question also about you know the benefit of partnering with an IT company. Um, you know, we talk about that security aspect of it, and you know, we keep saying you know compliance is not security. Uh, same 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 aspect with security. There's so much more to uh, network security than just HIPAA and high tech uh, regulations. Um, we we also try to be very proactive with uh, here at Lutrum, be very proactive on what you need to be doing and give you some really great advice to help you out over the next six months to a year. So we really work with the company uh, very much to kind of spread that out and and get you it's keep you help you stay ahead. So when HIPAA and high tech they come in there and they got this new program or new new regulation most of the time we've already implemented it so yeah you're omnipotent is that what you're saying hey, oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. all right well folks I uh, really appreciate you joining us on our webinar I hope you got a lot of great information out of this uh, all three of us are very very uh, passionate about what we do and about taking care of you and, and taking care of your patients uh, so again, we really appreciate you joining us. Please don't hesitate to give us contact or give us uh, or contact us if you have any questions. Uh, email address there is on the slide. Uh, get a hold of us, and we'll be more than glad. Other than that, with the people that have joined us, uh, we're going to try to follow back up with you uh, in the near future here. Um, please set some time aside and, and allow us to help you out on any of your concerns. Again, thank you for joining us, and uh, we'll talk to everyone soon. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.